Okay, so this month we've got Dr. Tsung Wei Huang from the University of Utah, and he's got a Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and he's going to talk to us about TaskFlow, a general purpose parallel and heterogeneous task programming system using modern C. Take it away, Doctor. Sure. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, hi, I'm Chong Wei from the University of Utah, and my research essentially makes parallel computing easier to handle, so you can quickly boost your application performance. Today, I'm going to show you TaskFlow, an open source C++ programming system that can help you quickly write parallel and heterogeneous programs. You probably already know, parallel computing is critical to advance your application performance. For example, a single threading machine learning program can take several hours to finish, but it can be reduced to only a few minutes or even a few seconds if you are able to run it in parallel. That's the power of parallel computing. By leveraging many core processing units, we are able to speed up the performance by several orders of magnitude. However, writing a good parallel program is very challenging because you need to deal with many difficult technical details, such as standard concurrency control, task dependency, scheduling, and data rates. Many developer and researchers have a hard time in getting them right especially for those who do not have that much experience in parallel computing. The task force project is trying to offer a solution to this. We address the following question. How can we make it easier for you to quickly write parallel and heterogeneous program with high performance and simultaneous high productivity? By high performance, we mean the program has to run fast and scale to many core processing units, such as CPU and GPU. By high productivity, we reduce the time it takes to implement the program. Let's take a look at Hello World example in TaskFlow. Suppose we want to do four things, A, B, C, D, each representing a function or a task. A has to run before B and C. D has to run after B and C. When A finishes, both B and C can start and can run in parallel. When both B and C finish, D can start. This is how it looks in TaskFlow. Only 15 lines of code to get a parallel task execution. This is all you need. You create a TaskFlow object to manage your task dependency graph. And then you create an executor that manages a set of worker flag to run the TaskFlow. Here we use the method in place to create four tasks in terms of C++ Lambda and assign them to ABCD using structure binding in C++17. To build out a dependency, we use the precede method to force task A to run before B and C, and the succeed method to force task D to run after B and C. Finally, we submit this task flow to this executor and it returns a future object where we can wait on it to finish. At this moment, I believe many of you can fully understand what this code is doing. For task A, B, C, D, A has to run before B and C, and D has to run after B and C. The code itself explains itself through an expressive block description model. Here is what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk. I'm going to show you how to express the parallels in the right way by starting with the motivation behind task flow and the applications we target. Then, I will present how to use task flow to parallelize your application and give you a rough idea about how our scheduling algorithm is. Next, I will demonstrate some real use cases of TaskFlow and show you how it can boost performance in large scale parallel application. Finally, I will show, share with you some of my experience in using C++ to parallelize large application. So let's start with number one. I'm, go I'm going to talk about the motivation behind TaskFlow so you can express your parallelism in the right way depending on application. In the past, I've been developing parallel CAT software for BLSI system. CAT stands for Computer ADA Design. It is a software method to help people design integrated circuit, or ICD. You start from a high-level description of the hardware component, and you take it to the CAT software, and the CAT tool will generate a bunch of NANDs and synthesize it into a physical layout. So you can tap it out to get a final chip that lives in almost all the electronic devices today. This is a seriously complicated process. For example, if you look at the layout generation process, 
It requires partitioning a graph of billions of nodes, flow plan placing millions of cells in a very small area, roughly trillions of wire, to establish the signal connection. And we analyze the timing of all these billions of components. The resulting test computational graph in terms of encapsulated function call and task dependency, it easily go up to millions of tasks with cycle, dynamic control flow, and irregular computational pattern. It takes several hours to finish. We want to answer to this question, how can we write efficient parallel program for this monster computational task graph that has millions of CPU, GPU dependent tasks along with algorithmic control flow? Because building a parallel CAT tool is very complex, we want to find a programming system that can assist us with the implementation and deployment of parallel CAT algorithm. To this end, we have invested a lot in existing parallel programming systems, such as PFLAT, OpenMP, CPP flat, TPB, SQL Star PU, and so on and so forth. However, we found very few of them can meet our purpose. And the reason is as follows, and we'll be summarized to big problem of all these tools. First of all, our problem has very complex test dependency. For example, if you look at the analysis program, analyze, for example, analyze the timing of the circuit. These type of algorithm need to compute, need to compute the entire circuit network of billions of nodes and dependency. That is, the resulting test graph in terms of model function code and their dependency can go irregular and meaningless. And the problem is most of the existing tools, they are very good at loop parallelism, but they are not very strong in expressing heterogeneous task graph at this very large scale. Second, our problem defines very complex control flow. For example, optimization algorithm make essential use of dynamic control flow to decide where, where to spawn thread or where to do like mathematical optimization and to implement various comp computational patterns to carry out combinatorial optimization and analytical method. And the problem is most of the existing system and they require you to describe a parallel workload in a direct acidic graph or that, and they do not anticipate cycle or conditional dependency. And the result of that is, of course, you do not have end-to-end -end parallelism because you need to partition your workload or algorithm across control flow especially at the decision-making point, and you synchronize your parallelism at that decision-making point. To better understand this problem, let's take a look at an example of an iterative optimization program. Well, this program has four tasks, and you start with the init task, the initialize some data structure, and it enters the optimizer task to perform some optimization, for example, solving a linear system using a GPU. Next, it moves on to the converge task to check if the optimization converge. If yes, it goes to the output task or stop. Otherwise, it moves back to the optimization task again. You can see this program has an iterative control flow over here, right? Depending on whether you converge or not, you go back to you go back to the optimizer and loop the procedure over and over. Doing this iterative control flow in a single threaded setting without any parallelism totally makes sense. But it is very difficult to do in a parallel environment. So think about this. What if we have millions of such tasks? And how do we use existing tool to express these millions of control flow with end-to-end -end parallelism? After several years of research, we arrived at a key conclusion. We need a new C++ parallel programming system. And the takeaway here is, while designing parallel algorithm is non-trivial, what makes parallel programming an enormous challenge is the infrastructure work of how to efficiently express those heterogeneously dependent tasks, CPU, GPU dependent tasks, along with algorithmic control flow and scheduling across heterogeneous computing resources. Next, I'm going to show you how we can use task flow to describe parallelism using a, a task dependency graph in your application. For the next few slides, I'm going to show intensive coding example because this is a C++ group. So I assume everybody is not afraid of um, reading code. 
And programming is very subjective. So many of my arguments are based on my personal humble opinion. There is no offense, no criticism. It's all about C++ from a developer's perspective. Task flow defines five task type, static task, dynamic task, CUDA flow task, condition task, and module task. Static task is the most basic data task type in task flow. It takes a callable object and runs it. A dynamic task lets you spawn a task dependency graph during the execution of a task. So you can do dynamic parallelism. A CUDA flow task lets you describe a GPU workload in a task graph and offloads it onto a GPU. A condition task lets you integrate control flow into a task graph. So you can describe end-to-end -end parallelism. A module task lets you compose a large task flow graph using smaller task flow. They are easier to optimize. In this Hello World example we've seen before, the four tasks, A, B, C, D, are static tasks. They take four lambdas and run them. The same Hello World example, but written in OpenMP's testing interface, we know OpenMP is a language extension to describe parallelism using compiler directives. It's a very popular programming library. Almost all people start with to learn parallel programming. In this example, we use we have to use OpenMP test syntax to create four tasks. Remember, we have this test graph A, B, C, D. A runs before B and C, and B runs after B and C. Here we use OMP test syntax to create four tasks, test A, test B, test C, test D. And then we use this depend clause to manually explicitly specify the dependency. In this case, we create two variables to specify the dependency between A and B and dependency between A and C. And we repeat this procedure for the remaining three tasks. The code is not very complicated, but aesthetic. You need to explicitly define everything such that the compiler will know how to generate a dependency for you. Another big problem is you are responsible for a proper order of written tasks. And that order has to be consist sequentially consistent with the sequential execution. Because when you compile this program with OpenMP disabled, everything falls back to sequential execution. So you gotta make sure the order you write the task it's not breaking a dependency when they run in serial. And it makes it very difficult to describe upfront parallelism. Same example, but written in Intel Threading Building Block Library, or TBB for short. TBB is a general purpose object oriented parallel programming library in C and has been used in industry for many years. The idea of TBB flow graph is very similar to task flow in a sense it describes dependent tasks using a flow graph. You create a flow graph and then you use this monster class template, continue node to create four tasks, A, B, C, D. And then you use another big template, continue message to describe the dependency among A, B, C, D. And finally, you have to identify the source task manually, which in this case is task A from the graph and you insert that source task into the scheduler. So the scheduler can start execution from the source task. According to our research, a TDB has really, really excellent performance, and especially when you are running it on the Intel architectures. But it turns out many API design and programming model defined by TDB is overly complex, and even though they are very powerful, I would say the main drawback is mostly on the ease of use standpoint in terms of simplicity and expressivity. What I just presented was my personal interpretation and it can be biased. So I did a survey, I asked about 100 students and those who are learning parallel programming in C++ the following question. How, will, how would you like to express a more complex test graph around like 10 tasks or 15 dependencies, and both for the following five different library, TaskFlow, OpenMP, TBB, Cocos, which is another library by Department of Energy, and StuThread. So what I'm trying to discover is how low C++ learner think about this parallel computing library, especially for those who are just getting started to learn parallel programming. And this is how it looks. About 74% will prefer to use TaskFlow. More importantly, the number one concern they have is 
my application is already very complex and I don't, I don't like a parallel programming library to become another burden in order to parallelize my application. So this is the, the goal we want to pursue. We want to let developers focus on high level algorithm as much as possible instead of wrestling with many parallelization details. That ends the first test type, static tasking. The second test type is dynamic tasking. You decide, you can decide, you can decide a task dependency graph from the execution of a task using a dedicated interface subflow. In order to create a subflow, you implace a lambda with an argument on subflow and you can describe another task dependency graph in that subflow. For example, here we create another task dependency graph during the execution of task B. And that subflow has three tasks, B1, B2, and B3, where B3 runs after B1 and B2. So when a scheduler finish A, it starts running B, and then spawn another task dependency graph inside the subflow runs B1, and then B2, and then B3. Eventually, the subflow join its parent task B, and then we move on to task D. This is how we spawn a dependency graph from the execution of another task. Subflow can be nested. You can create a subflow from another subflow and so on. This is an example of a task graph that finds the seven Fibonacci number using subflow. We know Fibonacci number is a series of number where each number is the sum of the previous two number. And this can be done with recursive parallelism. You can see from this diagram, we start from a task doing Fibonacci number at seven, and then it spawn to subflow at five and six. In a subflow five, it spawn another two subflow three and four, and so on and so forth, to compute the Fibonacci number recursively. The next text I'm going to talk about is heterogeneous tasking. You can offload a task to GPU. We manage heterogeneous CPU-GPU tasking through a closure-based interface CUDA flow. And the CUDA flow is a task associated with the CUDA graph and that is a new feature starting in uh, since the CUDA 10 on Turing architecture. So let's take a look at a simple CPU GPU application. Here I have a task graph that performs the very famous operation sexy D, single precision AX plus Y. Well, the application has the following four steps. It gets first, it gets to vector X and Y on CPU. And this corresponds to allocate X and allocate Y to allocate some data F for X and Y on CPU. And then we copy the data to data vector X and Y to GPU using two copy tasks, H to DX and H to DY from host to device. And then once we get the data ready on GPU, we run this sexy P kernel on X and Y. When we finish the kernel computation, we will copy the result back to CPU using another two tasks, two, two copy tasks, D to HX and D to HY. If you look at the diagram, the task flow graph looks like this. We have two tasks, LKX and LKY, and they have, they have to run before the CUDA flow task. And inside the CUDA flow, we have two copy tasks. They copy the data from host to GPU, and then, and then launch the kernel. After the kernel finish, we send the result back to CPU using another two copy tasks. A CUDA flow is very similar to a subflow. It takes an argument of CUDA flow and then will be created during execution of that CUDA flow task. Within this CUDA flow, you describe multiple GPU work such as data transfer kernels or other CUDA specific operation in a task graph rather than aggregated operation using CUDA stream. Well, in this case, I have two copy tasks to move X and Y from CPU to GPU and a kernel task that offloads a written sexy P kernel to GPU on X and Y. Another two copy tasks 
to get the data from GPU to CPU. Of course, the kernel test has to run after the copy test from CPU to GPU and run before the copy test from GPU to CPU. And we leverage the power of CUDA graph to launch the entire GPU test graph in a single kernel call instead of multiple one where you usually need to manipulate using CUDA stream. So we can largely reduce the overhead of kernel call. And when you finish the description of the GPU test graph, you can pipeline the entire CUDA flow with other CPU tests or other CUDA flow. And this is very important because CPU GPU programming always involves some data transformation tasks at expensive costs. Without a suitable test graph interface, it's very difficult to express this overlap. And we can take the most advantage from CPU GPU programming. And why do we do this closure based design? First, our closure enables stateful interface. You can capture data in reference. You can capture data in reference to marshal data exchange between CPU and GPU tests. Again, this is very important for graph parallelism because when everything is formulated as a task dependency graph, you need to make sure the computation result of some other tasks are visible to other tasks. For example, we use CPU to compute some data allocation, to compute some parameter. And that parameter may be algorithm specific. When that task finish, this update has to be visible to the GPU task. So we can run everything in end to end. This is why we want to use this closure based interface because it gives us stateful control, stateful interface. Of course, this interface also hides the implementation detail judiciously. And it provides a lightweight abstraction of a GPU implementation. By default, we use a CUDA graph due to its excellent performance. It's much faster than the uh, manual stream operation based on our profile. And also this closure interface is extensible to new accelerator type. For example, we may have another closure for TPU flow or FPGA flow. And one thing I would like to highlight is we do not try to simplify kernel programming but we focus on CPU GPU tasking that affects the performance to a large extent. Because when you make a mistake, typically kernel can run very fast. And when you make a mistake on scheduling, on describing the dependency between CPU and GPU tasks, that, mis that mistake may outweigh all the performance benefit of your kernel programming. And this is the same reason for data abstraction. We don't do any data abstraction, but ask users to use a plan a CUDA pointer so they can take the most advantage from those native programming toolkit. And this also give this also gives Tesla a unique advantage to uh, complement many of the existing kernel programming system. Any questions so far? Before we move on to the next number four task. Okay. The next text type is conditional tasking. And this is a powerful interface to enable dynamic control flow. And we believe this is one of the key features that stands out task flow from other library. You can create a condition task that returns a value indicating the next immediate successor to run. In this example of iterative optimization we have seen before, I have a task graph of four tasks in need optimizer, converge, and output. In need task, initialize the data structure we need for optimization. Optimize the task, launch the optimization algorithm, such as solving a linear system in a matrix form on GPU. Converge tasks, check if the optimization converge, and it forms the cycle back to the optimizer if we haven't reached at the convergence, or it proceed to the output task and stop. The converge task here is a condition task. It precedes two tasks, optimizer and output. With this order, when the return value of this condition task is one, when it returns one, the scheduler will proceed to output and stop. When it returns zero, when it returns zero, it informs the scheduler to go back to the optimizer task again. And we specify this in the return value of this task. 
Well, in this example, there are automated four tasks ever created, even though it's an iterative process. You can describe this iterative workload in a whole graph entity using only four tasks. There's no need to partition with a graph or synchronize it across iteration, which is a decision-making point. A condition task can handle more complicated scenarios, such as nested and non-deterministic control flow. In this example, I have a task graph of five nested cycles. Each green task here is a condition task. It flips a binary coin to decide the next path, either move on or go back. If it returns zero, it moves on to the next task. If it returns one, it goes back to the first condition task. There are five such tasks to flip a binary coin. You can infer that the average number of condition tasks you need to go through before reaching the task end is 32, right? Because you get a probability of one over two at each condition task to move on. And there are five condition tasks. So the expected number you need to go through the condition task is 32. Well, similar to the previous example, ultimately we use only five condition tasks to model this nested and non-deterministic task execution, even though we may end up with 32 execution in average. The scheduler will reuse all these five condition tasks. How do existing framework handle condition? We know many of the task programming systems are based on direct acidic graph. They do not allow cycle. They do not allow conditional dependency. Well, the most common solution is to expand the task graph across fixed state iteration. For example, if you happen to know your loop condition is going to span five iteration, you can unroll the task graph by five times, right? You can concatenate the graph, duplicate the task graph by five times and concat concatenate each of them one after another. The result of that is, of course, increased graph size and memory consumption. But what if a loop condition of a non unknown iteration, such as non deterministic condition? You may spawn dynamic tasks executing if statement on the fly to decide the next execution path. But that often gives you a very complicated and recursive implementation. Well, in fact, according to our research for generic condition, existing frameworks suffer from exponential growth of coding complexity. The final task is composable tasking. Well, this is a, uh, that is a key element to improve programming productivity through composition. You can create multiple task flow, each representing a portion of your parallel decomposition strategy. They are easier to optimize at a smaller scale. Then you can assemble all these task flow together to form a larger task flow that composed correctly and efficiently. In this example, we create two task flow, F1 and F2. F1 has two tasks, F1A and F1B. F2 has four tasks, F2A, F2B, F2C, and a module task composed of task flow F1. And you can do this composition in just one line of code using the method composed of. Here, F1 has two static tasks. We use static tasks to interface to create two static tasks for F1, F1A and F1B. And for F2, we create three static tasks, F2A, F2B, and F2C. And then we create a module task, we create a module task, F1 module task from the task flow F1 using the compose of method. So this is how composable tasking work. When schedule, when you submit task flow F2 into the schedule, the schedule will start with F2 A, F2 B, and then move on to the module task that spawns the task flow F1. When it finish, it run F1 and F1B in task flow F1. And when it finish, it move on to F2 C. So this is how composable tasking work. We can partition a large task flow into several smaller task flows. And each of them is easier to compose and optimize individually. The biggest advantage of task flow is everything is unified. You use the method in place to create a task, which can be either a static 
task, dynamic task, condition task, composition, or CUDA flow. And you use the single method precede to relate a dependency between tasks. And you can create a really, really complex test graph that combines all the five task types and integrate control flow into your test flow. So everything runs in end-to-end. -end. This is another example of using test flow to describe k-means clustering using CPU and GPU tests. k-mean is a cluster, clustering algorithm that tries to find the best k-centroid among a set of points. It's an iterative process. You have a CPU and GPU test running iteratively to compute the k-centroid. Well, here we use a single. Or here we use only a single task flow to represent the entire k-means workload. We have one CUDA flow to copy the data from CPU to GPU, and then we have another CUDA flow to launch the kernel for finding the k-centroid. Because this is an iterative process, we use a condition task to model the iteration until the kernel converge. Then we use another CUDA flow to perform device to host data transfer to send the result back from GPU to CPU. We have learned the core programming model of test flow to describe a parallel program using a task dependency graph. As a C++ developer, not only do we care about the expressivity of a library, we also need performance and that needs efficient scheduling algorithm. I'm going to show you our scheduling algorithm and how we can submit a written test flow with control flow into an execution engine executor. An executor is where you submit a task flow to run tasks defined in that graph. An executor manages a set of worker flags to run task flow. And all execution methods are non blocking and phase safe. So you can pretty much do whatever submissions you want. So let's take a look at this example. Suppose we have uh, three task graphs task flow one, task flow two, and task flow three. And we have an executor. And here in inside the executor, we define several methods to run a task flow. For example, you can use the method run to run task flow once. Here we run task flow one by one, one, one time. Or use the method run n to run a task flow by multiple times. In this case, I run a task flow two by one uh, a thousand times. Or you can even give us a stop predicate to tell us when you want to stop running the task flow. Well, in this case, we take a lambda, a stateful lambda, that capture the variable i. And this run until method will run this test flow three by five times, because that's our stopping condition. In addition to running the test flow, you can also launch a test asynchronously using the SDL style async function call. And this makes it very handy if you want to create a task on the fly without any dependency. And the scheduler will autonomously execute all the tasks and decide which worker thread to run which task. And our scheduling algorithm has two levels, task level and worker level. At the task level, we decide how tasks are in queue into the values under the control flow. At the worker level, we decide how tasks are executed by which worker. In order to schedule tasks under control flow, we define two dependency types, strong dependency and weak dependency. A weak dependency is the dependency coming out of a condition task. Other dependency are strong dependency. For example, in this case, the, the dependency from the converge task to output and optimizer are two weak dependencies. The task level scheduling flow is as follows. When you submit a task graph, it starts with a task of no dependency, of course, because um, they have no dependency that they are the source task, including both strong and weak dependency. In this case, we will start the execution of a need task because it has no dependencies. When the scheduler executes a task from the queue, it branches the execution depending on the task type. If it is a condition task, it invokes the callable of the condition task, get the return value from the condition task, and jump directly into the pointed successor. Keep in 
Remember, condition types will return an integer value, integer va value indicating the next immediate successor to run. If the task you got from the queue is not a condition task, then we simply invoke a callable. That remains a strong dependency of all the successor. And in queue, those successor whenever dependency are met, becomes zero. And you can infer that without the condition task, the scheduling falls back to the normal direct acidity graph execution. This condition task is very powerful for you to describe control flow in a task graph, but it is also very easy for you to make a mistake. For example, you may not have arbitrary cycle, and the following example show you two common pitfalls of using condition tasks. In the first task graph, we have a condition task A. It precedes three tasks itself, task B, and task C. The problem with this graph is it won't get scheduled. This is not going to schedule because there are no tasks for us to start with. Remember, we always need to start with the task of zero dependency, including both strong and weak dependency. And there are no such tasks. So the fix number one is to add a source task S and have it precede task A. In this case, we can start with the task S. Now the second pitfall here is you may run into task race. Both task E and C have no dependency. So they are source tasks and they can both start at the same time. When E finish, when E finishes, it will in Q task D because it has strong dependency, decrement and strong dependency becomes zero. It in Q task D. At the same time, if task C finish and returns zero, well, then the scheduler will include task D. And we may race on task D. Right? To get it fixed, we need to add an auxiliary node between task D and C. And this, in fact, is to tell the scheduler that task D, the task D is conditioned by two situations. Both E finishes and C returns zero. And this totally makes sense if you think about this as a normal single threaded control flow. We will never run task D until both conditions are true, right? And for now, we give this to um, user. It is user's responsibility to ensure their written test flow are properly conditioned. That is, you should avoid test race under this test level scheduling policy. At the worker level, we apply by work stealing to run tasks. Work stealing is a masterpiece of work and we have spent a lot of effort. And unfortunately, I won't be able to cover all the detail, but I will try to give you an impression about how it works. So what is work stealing? Well, in a nutshell, it is a dynamic scheduling algorithm. Well, I finish my job first and then I steal job from you. So we can both improve performance through dynamic load balancing in a decentralized fashion, right? At this worker level scheduling, when a worker thread drains out its task queue, finish all the tasks in its local queue, it will try to get some more tasks from others randomly. And this is essentially the basic idea behind our work level scheduling algorithm. And there is an excellent talk uh, about uh, work state at SecurityCon 2015 by Pablo Halpern from Intel. Uh, you are definitely encouraged to watch it for more details. We have understood the scheduling algorithm in test flow. And next, I'm going to present to you some of the results we have, we have obtained by applying test flow to real applications. And this performance data is another thing users really care about. Before we move on, is there any question I can answer? I can save it to the end. The first application is a VOSI placement workload. We have applied task flow to solve. VOSI placement is a very important step in the circuit design flow. The idea is you optimize the cell location on a chip. A cell is essentially a gate, such as OR gate, NAND gate, NAND gate, and so on. In modern design, there are millions of such cells in a placement optimization that can take several hours to finish. 
The challenge is placement optimization makes essential use of dynamic control flow to describe iteration because it's optimization. To speed it up, we implemented a GPU accelerated algorithm by uh, published by UT Austin and NVIDIA last week last year. And we try to offload when like, we try to offload some of the critical computation onto the GPU by using our CUDA flow interface. Here is a partial test flow graph of four CUDA flow, one computation cycle to model the iterative control flow, and 12 static tests to describe only a tiny fraction of that graph. Well, keep in mind, the entire graph is much larger than this. It has millions of nodes, millions duplicate uh, in this graph. And here we compare the performance of test flow against TDP and StarPU, which are two popular test programming library. We measure the performance in terms of runtime, memory, and energy efficiency in these three figures. Blue line is test flow, red line is TDP, and light blue is StarPU. On the top left figure, the runtime plot, you can see test flow is faster and the different star to increase when the problem size become larger and larger. And all algorithms saturate at about uh, 16 CPU core, but before that, we found test flow is always faster. And this placement optimization workload is iterative. So we use condition tests in test flow to model the dynamic control flow. However, both PVB and STARPU do not allow cycle. We have no choice but flatten their test graph across the placement iteration to achieve end to end parallelism. Of course, the result of that is increased memory because they are invoking a much larger task graph that will otherwise be described in a simple condition loop if the program model can support that. Running this larger task graph also incurs, uh, also incurs a higher energy consumption. Of course, this also relates to our scheduling algorithm. And you can see here the power data of task flow is much more energy efficient than the others. The second experiment I'm going to demonstrate is a real application on machine learning. Here we try to compute the inference of a very large deep neural network. It has 1920 layers, each of 65536 neuron. And the entire network can take up to 50 gigabyte memory. And this is also the problem given by the HPC high performance computing community as their yearly broad challenging problem. So the figure here is a partial task flow graph of four CUDA flow because we have four GPU. Six study tests, a condition cycle for this iterative machine learning workload. Each CUDA flow has thousands of GPU operations because the graph is very, very, very large. So we have to invoke thousands of GPU kernel to compute the graph. And if you launch the entire, if you launch these thousands of GPU operations one by one, the overhead becomes very significant. And because this network is very large, the advantage of task graph parallelism starts to come up. Here, this slide shows the performance data where we, we, we compare test flow again with DDP and StarPU because they both support task graph parallelism. And this machine learning workload is iterative, and we use condition tests of test flow to model the control flow. But TBB and StarPU do not support control flow, so we unroll their test graph across iteration from in hindsight. The figure in the middle shows the runtime and memory at different CPU and GPU number. And again, the blue line is task flow and red line is TBB and light blue is start PU. In general, you can see task flow is much faster than TBB and start PU, regardless of the number of CPU and GPU we use. It's about two to X faster at the maximum we observe. Memory is also 1.6 less, 1.6 X less. And we attribute this to the use of condition tests. By using conditional tasking together with the CUDA flow, we are able to describe an entire workload in a single task graph of end-to-end -end parallelism. There is no need to explicitly synchronize your uh, uh, task graph across the decision making at the control flow. Task flow has a profiler for you to visualize execution timeline in your program. And the picture below shows the visualized result of this machine learning workload. On the top, you can see the execution timeline of each worker flag 
and their tasks and different color represent a different task type. And the purple here represents the CUDA flow. And in this machine learning, because most of our computation happen at the GPU. So you can see a lot of execution kind of happen in CUDA flow. And definitely visit the link here and you will be able to find out more detail about how we use modern JavaScript and D3 to provide the test flow program. I would like to summarize these two results with the key takeaway. Parallel programming infrastructure is just as important as the parallel solution itself. Different models are going to give you different implementation. The parallel code or algorithm itself may run very fast, but the parallel computing infrastructure you use to support that algorithm may dominate the entire performance. This is especially important when you consider heterogeneous workflow because control flow decision frequently happens at the boundary between CPU and GPU tasks. For complex workload, if you do not have a interface for expressing CPU GPU dependent tasks along with algorithmic control flow, the overhead to synchronize or partition your heterogeneous parallelism at the decision making point may outweigh its performance benefit. So far, we have seen the performance of task flow in real application. We talk about micro benchmarks, large scale machine learning, and VLSI optimization. Now I'm going to share with you some of the experience I've learned from using C++ to handle large scale parallel application. Hopefully our experience can contribute to making C++ more amenable to heterogeneous parallelism. Parallel computing is never stand alone. It beats nothing if it doesn't apply. No one will buy a parallel computing tool without application, right? So we must always bring parallelism to practice and apply it to applications. And given a tremendous amount of application, I don't believe a single model or API can express all parallelism. We need multiple CPP experts in parallel computing, GPU programming, or other accelerator design and programming because each of them has uh, expertise in a certain application. And for example, we cannot totally rely on a single powerful language or compiler to parallelize everything for us. Otherwise, the scalability becomes an issue. Here is how I think about the current status of C++ parallelism existing tool. And for me, um, C++ parallelism is still very primitive. Still that it's very powerful for you to control low level thing. But like I said, it's very low level. So you need to deal with a lots of difficult technical details. And many, many of them are error prone. You can use to async to launch a task asynchronously, but there's no way for you to describe task dependencies, which turn out to be more important in many applications. If there is no dependency, then everything becomes very easy to parallelize. There are no easy way to describe control flow in C++ parallelism. If you look at the C++ 17 parallel standard template library, SDL library, the only possible parallel infrastructure you may use is box synchronous parallelism. You run something sequential, and then once you reach something that can run in parallel, you fork multiple threads to run parallel algorithm, and then you join all the, all the threads and synchronize them moving on to the next sequential block, especially at the decision-making point at the control flow, because there is no interface for you to integrate control flow into parallelism. Of course, there are still no standard ways to offload tasks to accelerate such a GPU. To sum up, we have presented task flow as a general purpose parallel tasking tool. It introduces a simple, efficient, and transparent tasking model for C++ developers to quickly write parallel programs using minimal programming effort. We also talk about a general idea about a heterogeneous work state executor and demonstrated a promising performance in machine learning application and VLSI tech workload. There are many excellent efforts from the community on parallelism, and task flow is not to replace anyone, but we are trying to complement all the tool and the current state of the art and address their limitation on a task graph parallelism.
by leveraging the power of modern C++. We are very open to uh, collaboration and we believe the collaborative effort is the only way to make the community great and to make the C++ more amenable to digital change community. And right now we are based on CUDA for GPU testing, but we definitely want to integrate other accelerators such as OpenCL, GPU from AMD, or product from Intel, DPC++, and so on. I would like to take this chance to uh, say thank you to all the users, and there are quite a few people using Testflow right now. I'm very grateful for all the you know, very tremendously useful feedback, and I'm very open to collaboration again. Whether you are interested in using Testflow, understanding more uh, technical details, or getting me to have another presentation in your organization so we can talk about uh, more about CPP and digital genius parallelism. Uh, here is my email. Feel free to ask me any question. You can also find out more details about task flow at this GitHub link. With that, I'm going to cut here. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Yes. So this, uh, because I'm new, sorry. I I'm just uh, curious about this task flow. Is task flow is open source or is there any license that we have to pay or like also uh, in open which source. Open okay. source under MIT license. Okay, so it's free for commercial purposes as well. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm definitely very happy to uh, see whether there can be other commercial product on top of Tesla. Right now, we have a, quite a, a few startup companies using Tesla to manipulate the heterogeneous power reason. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so, so this task flow, I, if I'm uh, look at your presentation, it, it probably looks like a state diagram something like uh, national instruments using like so the task is flows like a, a state diagram from one graph to the other mm -hmm. is that is yeah. that correct well this is the advantage of using task parallelism because a task can be very general for example it can represent a state or it can represent a function or it can represent anything that is callable from the cpp context and then that you can specify dependency between different tasks. Of course, I want to um, give you a heads up. Task graph is advantages in describing a very large workload and schedule them very efficiently because you can always do whole graph optimization. However, creating a task also has a cost. And that cost in task flow is around, amortized around 10 to 7, 0, 70, 70 nanosecond. So the execution time of each task you want to model in a task flow graph better to be around the scale of uh, like a 10 microsecond to uh, several millisecond. So this is the granularity you should be aware of when using this task graph parallelism. Same for all the other library, because creating task flow graph or creating a task graph always has a non-negligible cost. Oh, okay. Yes. So, so for example, is uh, let's say if I just want to uh, use a parallel loop for very yes. simple task, which which one uh, is 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 more efficient and faster, uh, your task flow or OpenMP? Uh, if you if your application the has only loop parallelism, I would say OpenMP is a little bit faster, even though we also support loop parallelism. Okay. But using Tesla gives you another unique advantage for you to pipeline that parallel for loop along with other tasks. And this is not doable in OpenMP, right? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay, I, I just want to have a feeling. The difference is about 2% based on our profile. We are 2% okay. slower than OpenMP if, you, if everything you care is loop parallelism. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it means that task flow actually handle the underneath uh, handshaking. Of, yes. Of, okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. And when you mention about uh, collaboration, what what do you mean by collaboration? Well, it means you can either use task flow or trying to talk to to us because um, um, my group is working intensively on task flow. We are building system, trying to figure out more use cases and. Essentially, a, a, everything we can help you. <laughs> oh, okay. So basically, feature requests. Yeah, that, that's feature like... requests or get some okay. user experience um, because we are doing this in, 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 as a research project. Okay. We okay. want to make it industrial strength. 
Yeah, okay. Okay, got it. Okay, understood. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. So are you uh, working with uh, anybody on the standards committee to try to evolve the standard library to incorporate some of these ideas and get us a higher level library for parallelism in the standard? Um, right now, I would say not formally working with anyone in, inside the standard committee because it's going to take me a lot of effort. Um, but we are working with a um, SQL. I'm trying to integrate the people from SQL Copilot. And, you know, Michael Wang is one of the guys who is managing all these standard, um, standard community on, on the heterogeneous parallelism. And we are trying to, we are working with them, trying to integrate SQL into test flow. I, I would recommend just keeping track of what the parallelism group is doing. Yes. Uh, yes. So you can provide feedback if you feel like they're going off in, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we do have a we do have a very close you know discussion, but it's not it's not like I'm the formal member of that committee, but we do frequently provide some suggestion and you know to to share with those people our feedback, because task flow is essentially like I say, uh, we do not build task flow from the scratch, but from the application. And that application is a real application I've been doing since my PhD. And initially the test flow was internal. It was an internal project to a, a CAT tool I was building in my PhD. And later on we found out, hey, this can be, maybe we can make it a more general purpose pillar programming library. Because we start building this library from application. So we essentially build test flow based on what users want, not what library developer want. And that is a, a key difference between uh, when I when I look into many of the programming library. This is the one of the the, the difference I found. Good. I think I think we can benefit from having a lot of different approaches that we try, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then um, like we've done with the Boost libraries, and mm -hmm. then learn from those experiences and use that to inform what we put yeah. into the standard library as a proposed addition. <laughs> I think the standard library still can, um, I know like NVIDIA or Google put a lot of efforts on this executive proposal and essentially are trying to unify everything together. You can use the executive to submit each genius test or you can submit a networking test and which I found <laughs> may be too overwhelming for the single executor to do most of the thing in a unified fashion. So for example, this is one of the suggestions we share with uh, those people. But we found this uh, task crop parallelism really has a unique advantage, especially for large workload. And for example, this machine learning and this machine learning workload. And in addition to this uh, task crop parallelism, what we found is uh, a lot of performance gain we, we obtained was from the use of CUDA flow, or CUDA graph. Because in CUDA graph, you can describe multiple kernel together in the test graph, and then you use a single kernel call. And the CUDA runtime will manage all the scheduling for you. And you don't really need to spend actual efforts on top of, you know, because you cannot do better than CUDA. That's my, my perspective. So I think this test score still has a, is some a very strong advantage in describing complex and large workload that compose some thousands of CPU or GPU dependent tasks. Okay, uh, if we don't have any other questions, we can end the recording there. Is there any other questions? Okay. Good. Where can uh, we get the uh, slides? Is is it available online after this? I yeah, I can share, but how do I share? With... Oh, you you can put it in your GitHub, I think, right? Oh yes. Uh, um, if I have a many presentations, so I don't. Oh, know okay, but, okay. But you can always email me. Okay. If you don't mind, you can email me. Yeah, I email your LinkedIn. Uh, or go visit the test flow project, you'll find out information.